Come on, CF students, let's give them a shout of praise. Welcome to Summer Tour, and this is our last week. If you've been touring with us, we want to shout you out. If you've been here all the weeks, man, you are super spiritual, let me tell you. But if you haven't been with us and you haven't checked out all the segment, I suggest you go to our YouTube page and check them all out. Pastor Lewis, he popped off with depression. Pastor Gabe, he cooked with anxiety. Pastor Rob with identity. And today we're going to go over a topic that is so dear to my heart, so close to my heart. And I know that this series, I'm Not Happy, has blessed us all. And today we're going to talk about a topic that I've been through. So I want you to understand that this topic is sensitive. And if you need help, please reach out. If you need any counseling, please reach out to your student director or to your student leader or to your small group leader, please. But this topic, I want to preach to you about grieving. I know it's a topic that is tough to talk about, but I've been there. I know what it feels like. So I want you to go to the gospel according to John. And if you don't know anything about me, I love the gospel. I love Matthew, Luke, Mark, John. Matter of fact, I have a cool relationship with them. I don't even call them the gospel. I call them Little John and the East Side Boys. And you may not know that, but I love the gospel. So let's go to John chapter 11. Verses 32, and we're going to land at 37. And when you're there, say word. And if you need a minute, say hold up. I heard a hold up. I'm going to help you out. It's between Genesis and the maps at the end of the Bible. So we're going to go straight to it. Now when Mary, say Mary, came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been in this situation, this would have never happened. Lord, if you'd just been at the right time, none of this would have happened. Oh, I feel that. Now, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Then they said to him, Lord, come and see. And verse 35, Jesus wept. Come on, say it with me. Jesus wept. Come on, say it with your chest. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Like I've said it before, I don't do drugs. I do scripture. And that right there. Is some good scripture. Let us go into prayer before we start. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for everything you're doing in this series, Father. I know that it's a blessing to many, Father, and it's topics that are hard that we don't usually talk about in the, in the church, Father, but here we are, Father, talking about all these topics about anxiety, depression, grief, identity, Father, and you may move and you may touch lives, Father. And all of God's people say, amen. Now, let me start off with a question. Who loves doing chores? Raise your hand. Keep it up. If you don't love doing chores, we're going to have to pray for you because life is going to hit you hard. But I feel you. I hate doing chores. Matter of fact, I try to keep my room clean as often because I hate deep cleaning. But when I have to do deep cleaning, let me tell you, I love jamming out while cleaning. I put on my worship music. I put Bethel. I put Elevation. I put Upper Room Maverick. I be singing Holy Forever. Let me stop before the worship team hires me. But anyways, I love jamming out to worship music. Matter of fact, as I was growing up, that's one of my fondest memories. I remember my mom was starting off a business and She would work during the weekend. So my father, being a good husband, would tell me, hey, we're going to clean the house during the weekend. And so we called it Saturday for the boys. And so we would wake up, clean, have breakfast, and clean the whole entire house. And he was a fanatic of 70s, 80s, 90s music. And so he would put on a CD. If you don't know what a CD, God bless you. If you don't know what a CD is, oh, my God. 
If this is the best thing that could have happened, Spotify, Apple Music, but CDs, you would take them out, put it into a little CD drive, and it would play music, and you would have to change it. Sometimes it will skip the song. But anyways, we were listening to 70s, 80s, 90s music all the time while we were cleaning. And one of the songs that he would replay so often as we were cleaning is from this band called Boys to Men. And it was this specific song called, It is Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday. And I remember as we were cleaning, we would sing this song. We would sing out of, out of tune. And when the chorus would hit, we would stop what we were doing as we were cleaning. And he was, we would sing, it is hard to say goodbye. And at that moment, we would laugh because we, couldn't, we didn't know how to sing. And it was a precious moment. But little did I know, little did eight-year-old Josser know that 20 years later, he will be living out those lyrics. CS students, that is my title for today. It is hard to say goodbye. You see, I lost my father during the pandemic, 2020. And I want you to take a look at this video. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation where there is not a cause for alarm. The first US case has been detected. There's confirmation the coronavirus has reached Australia. China is urging its citizens not to travel abroad as it struggles to contain the virus. We will be standing up Christmas Island as a quarantine area. Foreign nationals coming from China are now banned from entering the country. I have today declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. So it was the pandemic and my father had COVID and we took him to the hospital. And you know, during the pandemic, we couldn't go into the hospital. So when we dropped him off, we went into prayer, believing that God will do a miracle because I believe that God still do miracle. I believe that God still heals. I believe that he's still on the move. And so I went into prayer. My family went into prayer, believing that he would do a miracle. And on that night, the same night we took him to the hospital, we received a call. Chaucer, your father has passed away. A phone call I never expected because I believed in God that he would heal. And it was so hard, so tough. CF students, how do you deal when grieving comes upon your life? How do you deal when death comes upon your family. You see, I came today to talk to you about those moments that it feels like God didn't answer your prayer. I came to you to talk about those moments when suffering touches your family, when pain touches your soul, and you don't know how to act. You don't know how to deal with it. You don't know how to overcome because grieving is so hard, and I understand that. You see, you may not be grieving the loss of a loved one, but you're probably grieving the loss of a dream. Dreaming of being somewhere, being someone, being a professional athlete, now that dream is gone. Or, your, or the loss of a, of a family that was together and now they're divorced and now you got to spend every other weekend at different houses. I also, or you might be uh, grieving the fact that you broke up with someone. Some psychologists say that breaking up with someone is the same amount of feeling and emotion as losing a lost one, a loved one. And so you may not be grieving the loss of a loved one, but you may be going through all this situation. And it's hard. I understand. I completely understand. But I want to start off by saying that through it all, God loves you. God has never forsaken you, has never left you. He is always there for you. He has never, ever lost a sight of what's happening in your life. But what happens when the God you put your faith in, the God you pray to, doesn't answer your prayer? See, it leads me to point number one. Write this down. Sometimes he is silent. Sometimes he is silent. Let's go back a couple of verses on John 11. We're going to go to verse 5 through 7. It says, now Jesus loved, say it with me, loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed how many days? 
two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now this is what trips me out of this narrative. The Bible says that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So what does he do when they receive a text message from Mary and Martha saying, the one you love, they don't even say the name, they say the one you love is ill and about to die. He stays two more days at the place where he was. Oh, if that don't get you mad. You see, and a little a side note, have you ever thought about how you would text or how you would message Jesus? Like, you know, some people, when they want to catch someone's attention it, while they're texting, they write it all in caps and all exclamation points. But when I text, if you know something about me, when I text, I don't proofread anything. I just send it out without any commas, any periods. I just believe that the Holy Spirit is going to guide you with, with what I'm saying. But if I were to write to Jesus... I would make sure my grammar is impeccable. I would make sure I would put the commas in the right place, the exclamation in the right place. I would even write in King James Version, like, hallowed be thy name, Lord, how Lord, your Lord, you are great. And I'll send off the text message, and he'll probably write back saying, like, homeboy, you're from Hialeah. Like, don't front, just talk how you're supposed to talk. And literally, that's how prayer works. Just say it out how you feel, just be honest with God. If you're grieving, if you're going through a hard situation, just be like, God, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to deal with it. You could even be more raw and more upfront and say, God, I don't even know if I have faith. That's what God wants. So back to the narrative, they send a text to Jesus. And what does he do? He leaves them on red. Oh, don't you just hate it when you send a text and someone leaves you on red, a very important text where you need to respond and they leave you on red and then they go two more days and then they respond saying, oh, I thought I responded. Ooh, that gets you mad. And so Jesus stays quiet for two more days. And I want you to put yourself in the foot of Mary and Martha, the, the anxiety, the the uncertainty, the, the pain, the suffering that they were going to. And to top it off, the Bible says that he loved them. He loved them. I would hate to know what he would do if he didn't love them. And he stays silent. He stays silent. He loved them and he stayed silent. And I want you to be very honest with me. Let's be upfront. Have you felt like you've been praying to God, and God hasn't been answering your prayers. He's been silent, and he's been answering prayers to people who are not committed to him, to people who are not even believers. He's answering prayers to, and you who have been coming to every rally, every summer tour, every Wednesday night, every small group, and you've been reading your Bible, God hasn't answered your prayer. He's been silent. Let me tell you, I felt the same way when my father passed away. I asked them, God, why couldn't you have healed him? There's so many people that went into the hospital and came out healed. People who weren't believers, people who were evil people. And yet my father, who was a believer, who was a good man, you couldn't heal him? And the answer I received was silence. And Mary and Martha cry out to Jesus. And the answer they receive is silence. And some of us can say that Jesus abandoned them. But let me tell you something. What we call abandonment, God calls it a process. See, I'm going to repeat that again because that's a bar right there. What we call abandonment, God calls it a process. You see, we want Jesus sometimes to change a certain situation, but what he actually wants to change is you. We ask God to do something for us, but what he actually wants to do is something in you. Because what he could do for you is temporary, but what he could do in you can last for an eternity. You see, we want the temporary miracle, but what God wants to forge is the it's an eternal change in your heart. 
You see, Jesus, more than anyone else, knows that in suffering and through suffering, there is vital transformation. More than anyone else, Jesus knows that in suffering and through suffering, there is vital transformation. But we have to be set free from this false illusion that if God loves us, we won't suffer. Matter of fact, I think the people that love God the most will suffer the most. So you have to be set free from this false illusion that because God loves us, we won't suffer. You see, Jesus didn't go up on the cross to die for your, your temporary problems. No, although he took it all to the cross, he went to fix your eternal problems. You see, John 3, 16 doesn't read like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so those who believe will be healed. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say for God so loved the world, he sent his only beloved son so those who believe will be financially prosper. No, it doesn't say that. It says for God so loved the world that he died on the cross for those who believe in him will have eternal life. They will not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross to fix your temporary issues. He died to fix your eternal life problem CF students and I'm actually thankful that he stays silent and doesn't answer our prayer because if not we wouldn't develop the character of Christ you see the worst thing that God could do is answer all of our prayers when we want and when we want it and so God stays silent sometimes but in the silence God understands us this will take me to point number two. He weeps with us. Come on, say it with me. He weeps with us. Look at John eleven thirty five. 35. It says, Jesus wept. Come on, say it with me. Jesus wept. Two words, the shortest verse in the Bible, but one of the most powerful statements, a statement that I believe will set you free tonight. Matter of fact, if you are learning any, any Bible verse, let it be this one. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. If you're trying to give some riz to your boo thing, trying to teach oh, that you know theology, tell them Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five, 35. And you will get that girl, I promise you. But anyways, back to the narrative. Jesus gets a text message. He stays silent for a couple of days. And now he arrives to the scene. He arrives to the scene Four days after Lazarus was dead. Four days. And he arrives to the scene and he probably knocks on the door with some pastelitos, some croquetas, talking about where's my hug at. And Mary looks at him and falls to the floor and cries out to him saying, Jesus, if you would have been here, this would have never happened. My, my brother is dead. You should have been here, Jesus. Where were you? Did you not receive my text message? Where well, you should have been here. How dare you come four days after my brother has passed away? Let me tell you, isn't that the cry we do sometimes when something happens in our life? When something horrible happens in our life, we tend to ask the question, God, where were you? You should have been here. You probably have lost a loved one and you probably ask the same thing or disease has touched your life or someone you trusted sexually abuses you. And you ask, where were you, God? You should have been here. And you're probably thinking I have the answers for you today. But truthfully, I don't. I don't have the answer for you as to why that happened. But I find something comforting in this narrative. You see, when Mary and Martha pour their heart out, when they go to Jesus and they say everything they need to say, Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He lets them open up their heart. He lets them cry out and he absorbs the bitterness and it says that he wept with them. He wept with them. He wept with them. The shortest Bible verse 
The shortest verse in the Bible is one of the most freeing Bible verse I know because it lets me know that the God I serve, the God I put my trust in, the God who saved me, the God who redeemed me, not only did he do, did he do all of that, but he also understands me. And when I'm in pain, he weeps with me. He weeps with me. That is so freeing and so comforting because so many nights I went into my room when my father passed away and I cried out saying, why did this happen? So much pain and suffering that I've gone in through my life. God, why is all this happening? But knowing that the God I serve understands me and he weeps with me is so comforting. You see, sometimes he has to stay silent for our process, but he understands and weeps with us. But point number three, and this is my last point, he is forever faithful. Come on, say it with me. He is forever faithful. John 11, verse 20 through 26. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he died, shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die again. If that don't get you up on your feet, I don't know what will. But Jesus is the resurrection. And see, what Jesus was doing is giving Martha a perspective of eternity. See, I'm going to show you, I'm going to illustrate you. This whole rope is eternity. And God lives in the perspective of eternity. You see, this little red mark right here shows temporary, shows our life on this earth. And the beginning of this red shows when you were born. And at the end of this shows when you were dead. And so God understands the perspective of eternity. He's all about eternity. And so I will give you an example from the Bible. Jesus promised Abraham that he would be the father of multitude in this lifetime right here, in this temporary world. And Abraham died only meeting a couple of his sons. Was God unfaithful to his promise? No. Because in the eternal perspective, those who believe in him have become the sons of Abraham. Abraham had many sons. You know the song. Sing it with me. I'm not going to sing. But the eternity and the eternal perspective, we understand that God is forever faithful. You see, God promised me that he will be with me. He will not be against me. He will always be there for me. And my father passed away on this red temporary timeline. Was God unfaithful? No, because I know that he is the resurrection. And on eternity, I will meet my father. And re, you lost your father three, three months ago. He promised you he will be there for you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. And your father had cancer and he passed away. And maybe there was a promise that he would get healed. Would he unfaithful? No, because in the eternity, although in the temporary, he passed away. In the eternal perspective, we will have new bodies where we will have no sickness and we will be with him forever. So God is forever faithful. Brooke, your mother got a divorce with your biological father and he's God promised he would be always there for you and he will never forsake you and it might have felt like God forsaked you when your parents got divorced was he unfaithful although it may seem it was in the temporary perspective 
No, because he knows he lives in the eternal perspective. He will always be there for you. No matter what happens in your temporary world, in the eternal perspective, God is forever faithful. God is always there for you. God has never left you and he will always be there for you because he is forever faithful. But we have to get out of this mindset that because he loves us, we won't suffer in our temporary world. But in the eternal world, those who have faith in him and those who have given their life to Christ, we will reign with him and we will be with him and we will be singing with the angels, holy, 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 where there will be no more pain, no more suffering. He will be always there for us and he always is faithful. See us students. I know you may be going through depression. I know you may be going through anxiety. I know you may be going through identity issue. I know you've been going through grieving season. But I want you to know that God is forever faithful and he's never left you, even though it feels like it, even though he, he is silenced through the midst of your storm. He never promised that we wouldn't go through, through storms, but he will always be through he will always be with us through the storm. See us students, this is who Jesus is. He is forever faithful. He died for us because he loved us and he loves you, see us students. Don't ever forget that. When you're going through those hard moments, when you're going through those days that it feels like no one understands you, know that Jesus wept with Mary and Martha and that is so comforting. That is so comforting, CF students. See, I want to end with a prayer. I want to do two types of prayer right now for those who feel a tug in their life that they say, man, this is the message I needed, but you've never given your life to Christ. I want to I want to take this moment and lead you through this prayer because the Bible says those who confess that he is the Lord and Savior, you need to confess that he is the, your Lord and Savior. And so I want to lead you through this prayer. Father, we come to you and we ask for forgiveness. Sorry that I've done it my way. Sorry that I've done things how I want it and my inwards desired of my heart. But tonight, today, I give my life to you. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. And tonight, I choose you, Father. Today, I choose you. I don't want this, oh, I don't want this temporary world. I want this eternal life for me. And so I give my life to you, Father. Man. That is a beautiful moment right now that you gave your life to Christ and we want to honor you and we want to help you through your next step. So if you gave your life to Christ, go to your student director or to your small group leader and let us help you through, through this life, through this temporary life as we go into eternity. But I also want to pray for those who are going through depression, anxiety, grieving, identity issues that are have been with Christ, have given their life to Christ, but are actually right now going through it. Father, thank you for the process. Thank you because through the process, you make us stronger. And you never promised us that we won't suffer because through the suffering, there is process and you've never abandoned us, Father. But I want you tonight to do what only you could do, Father. Let the students know that they are not alone that you are always there for them, that you've always been there for them, and that you've never forsaken them. You will always be there for them. You are forever faithful. And although we may, we, we, we may have lost loved ones, may we have gotten disease, may we even gotten depressed and anxious through all this, Father, you take control of everything. And I pray that you comfort us because you're near to the brokenhearted, Father. We want to thank you for dying on the cross. Amen and amen.
men, CF students. Come on, let's give a round of applause for those who gave their life to Christ and also made this prayer. Man, we love you, CF students. We hope this message blessed you and this series has blessed you. We love you. Peace out. <laughs>